Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's good to see all of you here tonight. I'm Chris Cook. I'm the executive director of FEMA Center for Contemporary Arts, and it's my pleasure to kickstart this evening's program. Uh, but before I go into more detail, please allow me to thank the generous sponsors who make our programs like this evening possible and accessible free of charge. First, I'd like to thank the Nebraska Arts Council and Nebraska Cultural Endowment, Humanities Nebraska, Institute Francais, Canada Council for the Arts, Omaha Stakes, and the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. While our current exhibition is closing on this Sunday, our programs won't stop. Please join us for exciting upcoming concerts and events, including this Saturday at 4, we have a special live performance of talk by one of our exhibiting artists, uh, Jean Charles, who's joining us here this evening. Welcome back to Omaha, Jean Charles. Also on Tuesday, the 29th at 8 o'clock, we will have our next uh, free concert in our music venue, Low End, which is downstairs, and it will feature the experimental jazz quintet, Elder Ones. Now I'm delighted to welcome you all here and online for Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens' lecture, Slavery's Hospitality and the Extraction of the Black Body, which concludes our four-part lecture series entitled Flesh It Out, The Body, Hospitality, and the Material Entanglement. This innovative program was initiated by curator Sil Sylvie Fortin who has been part of Bema Center's Curator in Residence program over the last couple years, and an integral part of the exhibition, I Don't Know You Like That, The Body Work of Hospitality, on view here until Sunday, March 20th. The series was developed in collaboration with and with the input of many affiliates of UNO Medical Humanities, Ted Kuzer Center for Health Humanities. We'd like to extend special thanks to UNO's Steve Langdon, Dr. Amy Morris, and Dr. Jo Joseph McCaffrey. We're also grateful for Humanities Nebraska's generous support of this collaboration and the ensuing program. By centering intersections between the arts and humanities, this public lecture seri series creates a platform for exploration and conversation. Our thanks to Bemis Center's dedicated team, in particular, Rachel Adams, Davina Schreier, and Jared Packard for their support, and to Alexandra Hamilton for his te technical assistance this evening. Now, please welcome, please welcome Sylvie Fortin, the curator of I Don't Know You Like That, who will say a few words and introduce tonight's speakers. Sylvie, welcome. Welcome, everyone, and first, a few words of thanks. Thanks, Chris, and the entire Bema Center team for their support of both the exhibition and the lecture series. Thanks to Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens for her enthusiastic response to my invitation to develop a new lecture in response to the current exhibition and for trusting us to bring her fresh ideas into the world. And thanks to Dr. Jennifer Harbour for her willingness to share her insights with us tonight and to serve as a respondent to the lecture. I look forward to a really lively conversation after the talk, both here in person and online. And now a few words about process. Tonight's talk will have three sections. Dr. Cooper Owens will speak for 50 minutes, um, a short conversation between Dr. Cooper Owens and, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Harbour will follow for about 10 minutes. And then the last 20 minutes are reserved for you, for your questions, your insights, your thoughts. Please share those with us uh, throughout the conversation online in the chat section if you're watching us uh, remotely. And um, also a quick note that this event tonight is recorded. That includes uh, the questions that you might share in the chat section as well as uh, questions here in the room. Now it's my distinct honor to introduce tonight's speaker and respondent. Uh, Dr. Deirdre Cooper Owens is the Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and the Director of the Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She's also the Director of the Program in African American History at the Lib Library Company of Philadelphia. And her award-winning book, you really have to read it, 
called Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology, was just translated into Korean amongst many languages. Dr. Jennifer Harbour is Associate Professor in the Department of Black Studies and Director of Ombud Services at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Trained as an American historian, her specialties include black women's history and activism, teaching and pedagogy in anti-racism environments, African-American history and culture, and international human rights law. Uh, her book, Organizing Freedom, Black Emancipation Activism in the Civil War Midwest, was published a couple of years ago by Southern Illinois University Press. So on behalf of everyone, in the audience, a warm welcome. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am going to do my best to, I think I'm supposed to go through, yes, some Bemis slides. So, you know, they, had, they brought me here to, to work, so I'm gonna go through some, some Bemis slides. I hope you all can see that. Let's see here. There's the talk that was mentioned. Uh, let's see, I need to take off these glasses. I'm at the age where when I take them off, I can see a little better. Okay, play from current slide. All right, and thank you to those who are on Zoom who have joined us virtually. I am um, really grateful for, for your presence. All right, here it is. The elder ones will be performing tomorrow. Um, and uh, let's see. Couple of thank yous. All right, so here it is. Slavery, hospitality, and the extraction of the black body. But before I begin my talk, I want to thank Sylvie Fortin uh, for extending an invitation to share my work and my ideas around slavery, around reproductive labor, uh, and, and around uh, a topic I had not actually given much thought to, which was hospitality. And so it really forced me to kind of dig inside my mental archives to think about the ways that slavery's hospitality was really an inhospitable space for its laborers. I am also thankful to the Bemis Center for hosting me as well, for those of you who have attended, and for all who have worked diligently to create this space for us, from volunteers to the staff, to those uh, who clean these rooms for us to, to be able to enjoy. And also to Dr. Jennifer Harbour, who I met many, many years ago, excuse me, in Omaha before I was hired, um, and who has always been uh, so collegial uh, to me. So I have to warn you, Jennifer, um, because I emailed you this presentation about an hour and a half ago. They will then see your brilliance because it will literally be coming off the dome. All right. <laughs> but you know, you know, those kinds of organic uh, conversations, I think, are the best. So. This is the last uh, of the lecture series, Flesh It Out, the Body Hospitality and Their Material Entanglements. And so I typically am not in the business of objectifying black women. But when we think about hospitality and we think about slavery, I wanted to really have a jarring and shocking image, right? The ways that slavery's hospitality helped to build the wealth, not of the South, but of the nation since its colonial past, until, the 18, six, uh, until 1865 at the end of the Civil War, and even the remnants of slavery's institution building is embedded in corporations that we don't even think of, in industries that we don't think of, from the prison industrial complex to the medical industrial complex to insurance companies, all of those kinds of things. And it was inhospitable for those who were forced to, to labor, right? And so this image, of an enslaved woman whose name we don't know, uh, nursing a black child and a white child. And this is a pretty well-known image uh, in 19th century, uh, in 19th century kind of uh, the, the slavery studies. And underneath you see it says Southern hospitality. And so I was really thinking about what Southern hospitality means. I'm someone who was born in the South uh, in a particular place. I don't know if many of you have heard of the low country in South Carolina and the Gullah Geechee uh, people. Well, I'm, I'm in, right? Um, born in Georgetown, South Carolina. People often look at my face and wonder where I'm from and they are very disappointed when I don't say Cameroon 
or Nigeria or Ghana, and I'm like, South Carolina. And they're like, sis, are you sure? Where are your parents from? They must not be from the States. I was like, well, when South Carolina was a colony, my ancestors were still there about 300 years ago, right? And so this notion of what the South means and labor and hospitality has always been something I think that I grappled with indirectly, right? It was something that was kind of explicit and both implicit. And so there's an enduring myth of Southern hospitality. In fact, for five years, I lived in the hospitality state, Mississippi, when I taught at the University of Mississippi. And I was always told about the beauty of the state and the hospitality of the people until they um, literally ran my very white looking husband, Zoom audience, you can't see him, but for those, I made him sit next to, to my bags, but he's the, the white looking black man. Right? And, and so my faux interracial um, relationship was an inhospitable presence in the hospitality state, right? Welcome to the South, y'all, with the magnolia flower, which is also the state flower of Mississippi. And the reason that I'm kind of picking on Mississippi is not that Mississippi is so exceptional in terms of the, its treatment towards people, because you can find that treatment anywhere across these United States, but at, at the kind of at, at the start of the Civil War and in the midst of the antebellum era, slavery's hospitality literally placed Mississippi as the richest state in the in the Union. Slavery placed Mississippi as the richest state in the Union, not the South, in the Union. Slavery placed the United States as the fourth richest nation globally. And it was because of the folk in the image that you see, right? It's Mississippi cotton picking. Right? Those were the people who literally made this happen. And so when we think about this enduring myth of Southern hospitality, we have to think about all kinds of things, class and status and what labor means and what hospitality means. And so that brings me to another really important topic, right? And it brings me to you know genealogy. And I like to always, if anybody has ever seen my talks, I always talk about an intellectual genealogy because A, I think it's important, but also I'm the child of someone who worked at the National Archives for 30 something years in DC. So genealogy is really important to me personally and professionally. And so why is slavery important to understanding US notions of hospitality? Well, it's important because when you have, in particular, a slaveholding region, which was the South, right, that prides itself on an enduring legacy of hospitality, we have to think about the tensions that exist right, between those who are owned and those who were owners. And so before I begin with Derrida, because I warn you, I'm not a theorist. Right? I was a little nervous because I was like, wait, everybody, they theorized before me. I'm a historian. So I, I historicize, I contextualize, that's what I do. And so Derrida is gonna be about the only theorist that you hear, right, from the European canon. But there's some other theorists, right, whose names have been lost to the record, but I think what they theorized on was important. So I bring a quote from the WPA narratives, that means the Workers' Progress Administration, it was a part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, the mission during the Great Depression to give scholars and artists work. And so some of those workers were um, commissioned to collect the oral histories of people who were formerly enslaved. And I will never forget this woman who was asked about slavery from her interviewer, and she said so poignantly, and this is something I think that can be uh, theorized, she talked about the meanness of her master. And she said, master was so mean, he studied meanness, which lies in direct contradiction to this notion of Southern hospitality. And so as much as the land-owning class, so the plantocracy, was grateful for the hospitable nature of the environment, of the land, of what the institution of slavery provided, its workers had to contend with something else. And so that's always stuck with me, right? Massa was so mean, he studied meanness. That means he went an additional step beyond what was considered normal in terms of the kinds of dehumanizing effects of this institution and those who worked within it. And so then in the European canon, you have Derrida, right? The very famous French philosopher, he's known for his deconstructionist uh, work, 
within philosophy. And he says about hospitality, we do not know what hospitality is, not yet. And so that not yet, and he even repeats it at the end of the quote, right? Means that there's, you know, there are ellipses. We don't know yet. And so what I'd like to do is kind of bring a little tension to the ellipses and say, you know, nevertheless, there was slavery and perhaps some other ellipses, right? Because the slave, enslaved people knew that colonial and later American concepts of hospitality left them outside of the parameters of invited guests, right? And this is essentially what Derrida was, was asserting, right? That the host has invited guests and the host basically shows the invited guests their largesse through, you know, um, through entertainment and through compassion and through a, a notion of um, conviviality and congeniality, right? And so the guests who were invited were to experience the fullness of the host's congeniality. And so hospitality as a European philosophical concept is centered on various forms of generosity that extend from host to guest that is either conditional or unconditional with some nuances, right? For instance, one might say, oh, my home is your home, but you know that that person's not supposed to eat your favorite snack, right? Or break your, break your vase, right? Those, those kinds of things. And so he really sets up this notion of a conditional hospitality and an unconditional hospitality. Okay? And it really was about welcoming the strangers. But what does that mean when you are enslaved and you are not welcome, but it's your labor that's welcome, that's tethered to the system? How in the world, especially in the, the colonial context, the American colonial context that later uh, evolves into the United States, how does the black person, right? And even the white person involved in this institution, how do you make sense of that? How do you, disentangle all of these notions of hospitality. And so what I'd like to do, I'm a historian of slavery and, and medicine and, and gender and black women's history. And so what I'd like to do as we, as we continue this discussion around intellectual genealogies is take us back to that colonial space. In fact, a few years after Christopher Columbus discovers right, discovers the new world, right? When so new to the people who were living there, right? But just a few years after he lands in a few islands, the Bahamas and Hispaniola, now known as the Dominican Republic, what we find is the kind of institution building that happens in the face of slavery's hospitality and the inhospitable nature of anti-blackness that slavery was also built on. And so in a letter from the Seville archives, and this is where I'll probably have to bend down because I can't see, oh, you know what, I can just turn back and read here because this is better. In a letter from the Seville archives, an archbishop in Santo Domingo responded to a letter he had received from King Carlos II of Spain. The archbishop described a hut or a shack where a black woman, quote, took in the sick people and attempted to heal them or cure them. Uh, and so Stephen uh, Aceveda is the archivist of this collection in the CUNY Center. They have a CUNY Center in Dominican, uh, of Dominican Studies in New York. And so the woman, and so he, he's sharing this. The woman was described as pious and poor, and the archbishop wrote that before she opened her hut, there were no hospitals in Santo Domingo. Later, where her hut had stood, you see the remnants of this hospital. The San Nicolas of Bari Hospital was erected. It was a two-story structure considered very impressive at the time. And so for me, this was striking. In the midst of the development of New World slavery, as it was called then, in the midst of colonial conquest, in the midst of um, the, you know, the, the eventual exploitation of indigenous people, you had an African-born woman who literally comes to present-day Dominican Republic, and she decides to take care of sick folk. And her name is not even recorded. 
Now I'm gonna tell you how exceptional this is. These are folk, even before the advent of capitalism, they record everything of value. A lot of my students are often shocked when they learn that Columbus took a lot of trips to these islands, to this space that becomes North and South America and the Caribbean. And when they start to read his writings, consider the diaries or the journals of Christopher Columbus, they see that he took notation of everything. He described the smell of the wind, the direction of the wind, how the sea, how the ocean felt, the colors of the birds. He wrote down the names of people that he encountered, but her name wasn't recorded. The only thing that we know, right, as she's making sense of this inhospitable space to her presence is that she must provide labor and healing and erect a, the first site of healing in this colonial con conquered land, right? And it was a black woman who did that, who was African born in the late 1490s, right? And we don't really think about these kinds of things, right? And the ways that black folk had to continuously carve out spaces for themselves. And in the midst of this, be centered in their own humanity. She could have simply been beaten down, right? But instead, through the oppressiveness of the colonial project, she decides to give us the gift of institution building and healing. And so as the colonial project kind of gains its strength. It's starting to rise on both legs, right, fully. We see that slavery is becoming more welcomed than even indentured servitude. And as slavery is becoming more welcomed as the preferred choice of labor, right, there's a disavowal of African descended people that starts to happen. Because things become codified now. That means they're concretized, they're cemented, right? There are laws that cr are created. And so this image that you see is from a book that I'll talk about in the next slide, right? But it was published in 1705 by a guy named Robert Beverly. I'll tell you all about him. And you can see even in the image, right, of those books, those woodcut cut illustrations, right? London's Virginia. And who do you see, right? You see the money, kind of the property class sitting there enjoying the hospitality that this labor system provides for them at the expense of the extraction of, of Black people's labor under this system. And so Robert Beverly, prominent British-born landowner, political figure in colonial Virginia. In fact, some people have said he's the first historian out of this colonial space. And so from his book, The History of Virginia, he has to make a pitch to white folk in England because a part of the colonial project is about the extraction of labor, right? Those folk in that previous slide are not about to hoe and till the ground. That's not what they do, right? So in order to get more bodies in, that are, that's also independent of the Atlantic slave trade that's thriving, you have to convince people who've never left, right, the few miles outside of their birthing place to travel across the ocean, to do work for people they don't know with the hope that they might be free, right, that they could possibly become members of the property class. So what he does, he writes, uh, a tract that's essentially propaganda, but I don't say that in the kind of judgmental way. It's propaganda because you're trying to get people to come right to this space. And so in it, he tells these potential colonists who might also serve as indentured servants that there's a difference between servants and slaves. And so the first line, if we go back here and you look, right? The servants, they are distinguished by the names of slaves for lives. Right? And servants for a time, right? So this tells you 
the difference immediately. Slaves are for life. That is your condition. Servants, and this means indentured servants, right? You're governed by a contract for a short period of time. Now, lest these white folk in Britain think that there's trickery afoot, Beverly goes even deeper and he says, slaves are the Negroes and their posterity following the condition of the mother according to the maxim, her two secretary ventrum, they are called slaves in respect of the time of their servitude because it is for life. So my students are often shocked by this. Wait, 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 what does all of this mean? I think I know, but what does it mean? And then I have to break their hearts, right? And let them know that democracy is a much newer concept than slavery, right? Slavery has been around since human beings have, have lived. This democratic thing, right, is pretty new. So what that means is not only is there a distinction between black people and white people, right, and servants and slaves, we also know that there's a gendered component where you're talking about a society that is based on patriarchy, but also a patrilineal passing down of status. And they are willing to forgo that when it comes to this particular labor system, because guess what? White men are having sex with black women. Indigenous men are having sex with black women. Free men of color are having sex with black women. And if those children are free, or even the children of servants, their condition follows that of the father. But partus sequitur ventrum means that it follows the condition of the womb. And I'm also being very intentional when I use the word it, because we are not legally talking about people anymore. We're talking about chattel or movable property. And so the gender component that happens it happens a couple of times here, but this is the first time it's mentioned. Now, when these slaves, who are gonna be slaves for lives, to ensure that even the children born to enslaved women, right, inherit the condition of servitude, they've now literally turned a, patri a patriarchal system on its head. And they've now, and it's not, some people have gotten that mixed up with power. Oh. These people have created matriarchy. No, 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 no. Archie, right? That, that suffix, that means power. No, what they've created is just a matrifocal, a matrifocal family within these black units, and that's very different. That has nothing to do with power, right? In fact, you've disempowered folk. So that means that when you had children like, you know, Sally Hemings' children for Thomas Jefferson, and I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. People like my husband don't come out looking like that just because they have a white mama. The black people on his side don't look like me. In fact, I'm like, do, do any of the black people on your side of the family look brown like the crayon? And he's like, um, I don't think so. <laughs> right? Needless to say, his early relatives come from the colony of Virginia, um, but I digress, right? <laughs> so, so what that means essentially is a black woman can have a child by a president, and that child will never, ever, 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 no matter how white they look. And Sally Hemings was more European than she was black, than she was African. During the time, she would have been considered a quadroon. Her children were octoroons, according to the racial classifications of the time. She was Thomas Jefferson's white wife's half-sister who had blonde hair. She didn't look like me. And despite her white skin and her blonde hair and those children who were considered octoroons, the inhospitality of slavery meant that they needed their labor in order to not just extract service, but money. And so this is the first gender component. Servants are those which serve only for a few years according to the time of their indenture or the custom of the country. The custom of the country takes place upon such as have, it, as have no indentures, right? So the nature, the practice of this place, 
uh, is that they have no indentures, right? For black people, they mean. Now, the other gender component that I didn't put in here, because my gosh, if any of you ever want to look at this piece by Beverly, it's fascinating. He also talks about the ways that uh, black women and white women are to conduct labor based on their status as indentured servants or slaves. And as he's very clear, just in case the white folk in Britain are like, mm, is he still trying to bamboozle us? He says, no, no, no. Let me also be clear that black female slaves, along with black male slaves and white male servants, are to till the land. White women servants of good standing are not to till the land. And so what that works out to be, right, even in terms of the economy and taxation, is that when white women then move out of servitude and they're married so that they can get a foot up in society, their husbands will never, ever, ever, their fathers will never, ever be charged or for taxes for the white women in their families or in their households. But a black man who might become free and own property is taxed for every black woman, free, enslaved, or servants. This is the inhospitality right, of this labor institution. And so this brings me to you know, the, oops, the thing that I, I tend to talk about a lot, reproductive labor and slavery. And often my students are like, what, what does this mean? And I'm like, so reproductive labor is, there's productive labor, so you know those images that we see of people who are you know, doing agricultural work or cleaning the house, right? That's considered productive labor, but there are also things that are considered reproductive labor that's very gendered. So for instance, um, domestic chores that are uh, divided by um, kind of woman's work or girl's work as compared to boy's work, right? So a woman or girl would not be a butler. She would be a chambermaid, that kind of thing. But there are also these other conditions to reproductive labor. And so a part of this includes the biological process of being a girl or a woman. So that kind of jarring, shocking image that I showed you of the wet nurse. And that was, that was an economic labor classification. There were ads in newspapers for wet nurses. It was seen as a skill that black women possessed. Right? So the biological functions of a, a girl or a woman's body during this time was considered reproductive labor. So she got her, her menstrual cycle. Is she engaged in sex or was forced to engage in sex? Um, if she gets pregnant, when she gives birth, uh, whenever she breastfeeds, all of those things, reproductive labor. Even the kind of healing work that was done, reproductive labor. And reproductive labor is performed kind of within the, the sphere of the owner, but also within the domestic sphere right, of that enslaved person's home. If, if they have a man in the home, right? They also have to perform reproductive labor inside the home, right? For, for their husbands or, or partners, those kinds of things. And so here are some images, right? Um, and these images are clearly, you know, from the perspective of the white folk who either painted them or took those daguerreotypes. One is a 20th century uh, image painted by Robert Tom. It's, um, an image of James Marion Sims, known as the father of American gynecology, who was kind of sitting there in this, you know, in his long coat, thinking deeply about what he's going to do to um, cure Anarcha, one of his enslaved experimental patients of this gynecological condition that she's suffering from. And you can see, right, the two white medical assistants who are also there to learn, but to assist him, right? Um, we see an, uh, Betsy and Lucy, the other enslaved women, kind of peering behind the stark white sheets in this room so that Sims has privacy. But let me tell you about the real nature of slavery, right? Because this was Robert Tom painting this in the 1950s. 
in commemoration of Sims's developments and advancements in American gynecology. So this is an imagined scene. There were no, no cameras on slave plantations in the 1840s when Sims was doing these experimental works. So we have no clue how Anarka Betsy Lucy or the other uh, nearly half dozen or so uh, enslaved women looked. And certainly, slavery doesn't allow for privacy. Slavery is about the gaze, right? And it is very myopic. It is the white gaze onto black folk. And if you, I mean, I did a postdoc at, uh, at UVA, right? The Uni University of Virginia that Thomas Jefferson founded. And I can tell you, you can tell Jefferson was a plantation owner if you ever go to UVA, because it looks just like a plantation. I mean, my Lord, I thought Ole Miss, nicknamed Ole Miss because of the, literally, I'm not making this up, you can, you can Google it, for the old mistress. I mean, the vestiges of the plantation south are everywhere in those kinds of schools. But if you look at UVA, you will literally see that it looks like a plantation. It, it looks like Monticello, where there's like a big house. And the big house allows you, right, the kind of, the, the, the kind of vision to be able to see everything that is going on on the plantation. And these are big places. They are two to three miles wide. And so there is no privacy, right? And in fact, for black women especially, involved in this extractive reproductive labor, you are at the mercy of those who own you or lease you. In the case of Sims, he was leasing these women from their, from their owners. And so what really happened is, and you'll see his hospital in about two more slides, but in the hospital that he, he had in Montgomery, Alabama, he invites folk just like how you are in, in, in this space today, right? For I don't know if the Zoom audience can see the, the physical audience. He invites people in because surgeries were very rare. And what he allows these, these viewers to observe is his you know, experimental surgeries on these women. And they are naked. There are no white sheets to separate them from the audience because the belief was black women were immodest. This is why you have pictures. I mean, this is a time where you know, women are covered up. But this is why you have pictures of black women's breasts sh you know, being shown, even illustrations of black women being partially nude. Right, or nude, or ripped clothing. Black women were immodest. They didn't care about these things. They were lascivious and oversexed. Right? I mean, everything that you read said this, not by ignorant you know, men who were kind of you know, making things up because they didn't know any better. I'm talking about men who traveled. Let's go back to Jefferson. In his only book written in 1803, Notes on the State of Virginia, Query 14 is very famous because he literally says, the reason that people look like me, and that means, uh, prognathesis, so what he called this jutting of the jaw, right? A broad, flat nose, right? The reason that people look like me, they have underneath the braids, trust me, I have kinky hair, right? All of those things is because African women chose to mate with orangutans. But this was scientific. Lots of people wrote that. Lots of people believed that. So once again, when you talk about these kinds of things and you see this imagined scene from someone celebrating Sims, this really isn't about the enslaved women. This woman is clothed. You know, in fact, she even looks like she might be modest. She has her hands to her chest. You know, she's holding, you know, she's kind of sitting here. The others are allowed to peep around the corner. Like this is an imagined scene. Now this is from the actual antebellum era. And these women are dressed in finery, especially the younger woman. She is unsmiling. The baby is smiling, right? There's a, an image of the kind of more typical, what we would consider the mammy figure, right? She's holding a little white baby, female baby, you know, almost cheek to cheek. Once again, this is a, a white vision of what slavery provides for them. This is a white vision of Southern hospitality. How did extractive labor look for white people? It was about entrepreneurship. That earlier imagined scene celebrating Sims's work, 
it does develop something. It develops the sim speculum, still in use today, still called the sim speculum. But people are once again often, you know, shocked by the nature of how the sim speculum is, was created. It was created because he had access to women's bodies who were owned. And so when Lucy, the first enslaved woman who becomes known as one of these mothers of gynecology is in his slave hospital, he literally, after examining a white woman and, and coming to this idea that, well, if I had greater, um, a, a greater uh, vision to peer inside the vaginal cavity of, of women, perhaps I could fix the fistula or hole. So essentially it was a gynecological condition back then called vesicle vaginal fistula. Today it's called obstetrical fistula. But what it meant was when a woman was in a protracted labor, uh, and that essentially means in the antebellum period, two to three days on average, she is trying to push the, the fetus or the infant out and as you can imagine, there is a lot of friction that happens. And with that friction, there's a sloughing of the upper vaginal area. And with that sloughing, fistula can form. Fistula can be as small as a microscopic hole that we can't see with the human eye or gaping hole. Right above the upper vaginal area is the bladder, the vesico. And so the end result is incontinence. If there's tearing that occurs in the anal area, there's incontinence there too very common, right, for especially uh, during this time period. And so Lucy is suffering from that. Her owner sends her to Sims's hospital. She lives in a, a rural part of Montgomery, Alabama. And so what Sims does, and he, he writes about this in his memoirs, and even in the article that he published in 1852, he says, I took two pewter spoons, and I opened Lucy up and I peered in and saw as no man has seen before, everything was as close to me as the nose on my face. And so a few years later, we have the sim speculum because of the hospitality of slave labor, right? And the extraction of labor from the black body. And we literally have these, I call them factories that exist. So Sims begins in a rural outpost. So if you can see the lower picture that's surrounded by trees, um, it's, a, it's in Mount Meigs, Alabama, where he settled before he moved to Montgomery. And you know he talks about how he kind of built up his, his medical reputation um, because he first treated uh, poor whites, Jews, and he said free in words. And once he was able to kind of gather up his resources, he moved to, Alabama, uh, to Montgomery, the city, and he buys this hospital, right? That's kind of to my far left. And this is where the surgeries happen, where Sims for a few years, right? A little less than five years, he's really trying to perfect this. And it's a really wonderful example in terms of slavery studies, right? It's horrible for those involved, but it's a really wonderful example to show the extractive Right, the extractive labor of black bodies. Because there are several stages that we can think about. So first, Sims has this hospital and the patients are black women. He is able to, according to the custom, right, and also with the promise of hospitality shown to them, go to their owners and say, hey, I can fix these women, I can cure them if you allow me to take them into my hospital if you allow me, you know, in fact, I'll take all the cost. I'll, I will take on the burden of financial cost so that I can help them, right? And what that means is not just help them physically, but also increase the owner's labor once he returns them to him. Because remember, these are not legally considered people. They're considered movable property or chattel. Today we say enslaved people, them unused back then. Right, so enslaved people is really more so about us. That's not what it was, that's not what they were called back then. So he literally asks these people, hey, can I lease your property? I'll take care of the property in hopes that in fact, I'll cure the property and their value will be increased. 
Because remember, the institution, the organ of slavery runs on the healthy wounds of black women. Her two secretary ventrum. And after the Atlantic slave trade ends by the Constitution in 1807, by 1808, slave owners, and I'm talking about the, the huge slave owners, not the people who own one or two. I'm talking about the folk like Jefferson and Washington and all those people, Jackson and all those people that we know about, Grant, all of those folk, right? We're talking about people who owned hundreds of, of black folk. They are really interested in how in the world can we ensure that these black women are giving birth to children who live and that pregnancy, in addition to the, the grueling work, isn't going to take them out. So he asks permission. He's granted permission to get these women. He gets a little less, a little, a little more than about, in fact, it's about eight or nine. He says a little more than half a dozen. What we can figure out from the 17 and say people that he owned and leased um, that probably eight or nine were his experimental patients. And in this hospital, he has two white medical assistants. I know the name of one of them, Nathaniel Bozeman, who later buys that house in Mount Meigs. And they begin to experiment. And in fact, because he doesn't want to be rude, he invites his neighbors. He invites the, the elite members of society, right, the muckety-mucks, to come and observe the surgeries. And after about two and a half years or so of failures, the two white medical assistants leave because they're like, we're not learning anything. We're losing money. In fact, we think there might be, you might be you know, experimenting these women like guinea pigs. We're out. But because slavery is so hospitable to him, he says, oh, that's OK. I'll train the enslaved women to be my surgical assistants. And people are, even though I don't have on my glasses, I'll say you go like this. That is the response I always get. And they're like, no, why? And then I always have to say, well, what do you think enslaved people did? They worked. It was a labor institution. Just because those men quit, I mean, it brings up all kinds of things, right? The, the fictions around women, around black people, around white people, you know. Supposedly, black people were in a, a state of arrested development intellectually, and yet you, you teach illiterate black women the very same things that you taught your literate white men. But this is where, you know, I always say it's, it's poetic justice. Because after they became his surgical assistants, he actually, he actually got it right. I'm just saying. I mean, once again, the fiction is, oh my gosh, these people are lazy and they're stupid. And if we couldn't guide them and civilize them, they wouldn't know what to do. And I was like, well, if that was the case, wouldn't you stop using them? After about five years, I know for me, you work for me for six months. And I see you can't do a thing. You're out. I'm going to wish you well. In fact, I might give you a couple of dollars, but you're gone. So why in the world would you continue this practice for hundreds of years? Because they knew that this was all fiction, right? And it wasn't just about the extraction of their labor, but these people were good laborers. They were smart. They were human beings, no matter what, what was said on the page. And so he trains these illiterate black women to do the work of the white male literate surgical assistants, and he gets it right. But then let me tell you, this is the other thing that, you know, folk who were so interested in kind of lauding this in, in the, the, the actual medical discovery, right? The advancement needs to be lauded. The reason we don't hear about obstetrical fistula in this country anymore is because it's exceedingly rare. It doesn't happen. So it was an advancement, right? It ushered American gynecology as one of you know, the medical branches that literally put America on the map, the United States on the map, on the global map, right? But this is the other interesting thing because of the extractive nature right, of slavery, the, hus the hospitality that it afforded those who controlled the system. During the experimental phase, one of the women becomes pregnant for a white man and has a mulatto baby. And out of the 17 folk that Sims owned or leased, one of them, who was the youngest on this plantation who lived in this, this hospital, was considered mulatto, a little girl. Once again, the reproductive labor, the extraction of black women's labor, even at 
right? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. You're trying to suture these women up. You're trying to close holes, and yet childbirth creates a bigger one. But because black women's bodies were hospitable spaces for white men during the antebellum era, especially in the South, someone could enjoy her, bodies, her body even though she was sick and incontinent. And this woman then gives birth to a child who can never inherit the status of its father. So when we think about slavery and this notion of hospitality, right? Derrida was right. How do we ever know what it truly meant? At least from the white perspective. I think we know what it meant from the black perspective. They tell us. The other inhospitable, uh, inhospitality of slavery for black people. Nathan Bozeman, one of those surgical uh, assistants, he also performed experimental surgeries, this time on a, an enslaved woman uh, named Matilda Stamper. At least the illustrations around uh, Bozeman's depiction of this patient tends to be a bit more realistic, right? She's unclothed. Um, it's interesting, I was like, were all these lay people white looking in Alabama? I mean, it's just, once again, you look at 19th century, 18th century medical journals, you will often see that uh, enslaved people are kind of rendered white, which is, you know, this is an aside. When I was doing my dis dissertation, people are like, how are you gonna write a book on this? I mean, there's, there's no information. And I was like, well, yeah, if you open up the pages and everybody looks white, even though the word says slave, you might think that, right? But if you read what these folk left for us, you can very well see that there's a lot of information. So once again, Bozeman uses this woman's body, right? He extracts labor from her body to create the button suture method, right? That he was, he was highly critical of Sims's silver suture method, right? So Sims essentially says, if we use silver, you know, to suture the wound or the hole, um, she'll be healed and there'll be no ill effects. And, and Nathan Bozeman says, no, 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 I've experimented and it's a button suture method, right? But he's able to do this because of the accessibility of black bodies and black reproductive labor. But what does this mean in terms of the embodied experiences of enslaved women? And we can go right, all across the Atlantic world, whether it's Santo Domingo, whether it's France with Sarti Bartman, known as the Hottentot Venus, some of you may have heard of. She was South African born and enslaved. Her cadaver was used by Georges Cuvier, arguably in the 18th century, in the very early 19th century, the Western world's most celebrated natural historian or scientist. And it was used for display and pedagogy, right, or teaching. And it becomes an exemplar or a model for how black women would be depicted in Atlantic world medical writings and practices. We see this, especially in the United States. Four Ken uh, Kentucky enslaved women and one free woman of color as, as free black women were called then were experimented on to perfect surgical techniques for ovarian uh, tumor removal surgeries called ovariotomies. This happened one year after right, the closing of the Atlantic slave trade. So in 1809. And I'm thinking, wait, this is Danville, Kentucky, Appalachia. There aren't any black people here in the, I mean, there in the 21st century. My Lord, how many were in the 19th century? 4%. And yet he managed to find, find five. And guess what this meant for America, for the United States as a new nation. This is 1809, he carries these, in, and I'm saying, I'll say his name later because he's unimportant here. I'm really concerned about the, 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 the experiences of these enslaved women. So the guy who does this literally performs the first abdominal based surgery in the world where people live. And it doesn't sound like anything today. Back then there was no germ theory. Surgeries were rare. And if you cut anybody open in the abdomen, they died. And yet 
most of these women live. And when he writes about it, you would think that people would say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But this is what happens. Folk in Europe scoff because they say, well, of course, this backwoods country doctor, I'm literally using the words that were used in the Lancet, this backwoods country doctor would find success with this experiment because these were negresses and they bore cutting with the impunity of rabbits and dogs. So this idea that black women didn't experience pain, but also that they reproduced quickly, like rabbits and dogs. So Ephraim McDowell, right, is known as the father of the ovariotomy. But people don't think about the ways that this man in Kentucky with a 4% black population was able to extract the labor of these women, both free and enslaved. In Virginia in the 1830s, an enslaved woman was experimented on for a number of years. We don't even know her name for the treatment of obstetrical fistula, the very thing that the father of American gynecology did. She didn't heal because she was unable to, according to the doctor's writings, to stop engaging in sexual intercourse. Her body was made hospitable for some, someone, even while she was incontinent. Even while, she, even while she was undergoing surgeries, she was unable to heal. In fact, for eight clinical trials. In Haiti and Louisiana, in 1799 and then in the 1830s, enslaved women were used in experimental surgeries to perfect C-sections. Francois-Marie Prevost, known as the father of the C-section. He celebrated their historical markers all over Louisiana in Donaldsonville, right outside of Baton Rouge. But the real sticking point here, in another state known for its hospitality, we've all been a Bourbon Street, right? We've all had beignets and listened to jazz. Right? If you're black, you might've been at Essence Fest, right? All of those kinds of things. But this is, this is the thing about that, that hospitable space where people are friendly, right? Francois-Marie Prevost is considered the father of the C-section because he had access to enslaved women's bodies to perform these cesarean sections. And the sad reality is the legacy, uh, the legacy of this medical racism is that until the, literally until about two or three years ago, from the 1830s until the 21st century, Louisiana used more black women for C-sections than any other state in the nation. Guess what state knocked it to number two? Mississippi. And yet folk want to just blame James Marion Sims. And I'm saying this thing is structural. It's systemic. There is not one historical boogeyman. If we're going to talk about extractive labor and exploitation, we got to talk about the whole thing, not just one person, right? Because this is bigger than just one person. But what did it mean, right, if you were enslaved in a non-reproductive body? And yes, that is Harriet Tubman. This is a shameless plug. I'm working on a popular biography of her. So she's my, she's my girl crush right now. But not, you know, not for the reasons that we think. We all know she was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, all of that stuff. But Harriet Tubman was disabled. Another shameless plug. Go to Ms. Magazine and read my article on, on Harriet Tubman and disability. Because I'm thinking about the way she's shaping a nation in, in national identity around the ways that people had to make space for her disability, but also what that meant. Right? So Harriet Tubman might have been infertile. We don't know. Harriet Tubman remained illiterate for her entire life, and she lived 91 years. The reason that I think she might have been infertile is because she was married in her early 20s. And when she escapes at 27, she escapes as a married woman. Now, her husband was, was considered free. Most enslaved women, by the time they're 27, have children. She doesn't have children. And she was known as, I mean, a healer. She understood herbalism, right? Her, her maternal grandmother was born in Ghana. And so she always said proudly, she was an Ashanti woman, that her grandmother and her, her father taught her how to, how to heal, how to use roots and herbs, right? So she might have known 
you know, the indigenous plants or roots and herbs to use, but she was madly in love with her husband, right? Her first husband, madly in love with him. And so one would think, especially with the, the kind of gender uh, conventions and ideals of the day that she would want to have a child with him. She doesn't. The other thing that a lot of folks don't know in great detail, Harriet Tubman was not born with a disability. It literally becomes a workplace condition. Slavery creates the disability for Harriet Tubman. Once again, this is, you know, in this hospitable space for white folk that proved time and time again for black folk to be really inhospitable. And so she suffers a brain injury because when she's between 12 and 14, we're not quite sure, um, she enters a country store, Bucks, in fact, it's in Bucks County, Bucks County Country Store in Eastern Shore, Maryland, where she was a little girl. And there's a young black boy, 14 years old, who has run away from his either slave farm or plantation. The overseer is quick upon his heels. They enter, the, the young boy runs into the store, the overseer runs in, they, you know, they're, they're arguing and yelling. And so the owner, I mean, excuse me, the overseer looks at little Harriet. And when I say little, she's diminutive. Even as an adult, she's only five feet. She's a small woman. And he looks at this little girl and he says, get him. And Harriet told me, looks at him and was like, mm -mm. she didn't do anything. And so the overseer is so overcome with anger that he picks up a two pound weight to throw at the young boy who had run away, but it hit Harriet instead. So, of course, people think she's gonna die. She's bloodied. She, in fact, was leased uh, to someone who was extracting her labor. And she uh, is brought to her mother's home. This is the inhospitable nature of slavery. Families don't matter. It is why enslaved people couldn't legally marry. This is why people could be sold willy nilly, right? Family, slavery was meant for making money for, for the owners. It's not meant for families. In fact, fam, fam, the establishment of families is a resistive tool that Black people have, where they want to create some hospitality for themselves. They want to create some love and agency for themselves. So families actually stand in resistance to slavery. And that's why it always kind of trips me out when people want to use the nuclear family model against Black people. like. You know, 70% of your women were are, are single mothers. I was like, um, for the majority of the history of black people in this country, they've been single mothers. For your rules, not the rules that black, in fact, black people created rules that went against that. So you can't use it against us now when we were praised for it then. Like, make up your minds, right? But that's another conversation. So she goes to her mom, because her mom is enslaved which is why Harriet's enslaved, Harriet's dad was free. So you see how that part two secret adventure thing works. So she goes to her mom who, who takes care of her and the owner is angry. He tries to sell her, nobody wants to buy her because her value is lessened. Now she's a, she's a preteen teenager at this point. By the time she's an adult, not only does she have a lessened value as chattel, but she might also be infertile. So she can't even produce a child. And she's married to this free man of color. So for folk like her, and there are lots of folk where slavery has literally rendered them disabled, right? They stand literally in that kind of limbo of how do we contend with these competing contradictory forces? Right? Sometimes they're considered refuse slaves or unsaleable. They have a lower value compared to other chattel slaves. But it requires enslaved people to continue to draw upon the cultural knowledge that they possess to survive white people's exploitative behaviors and practices like slavery and anti-blackness. And so for folk like Tubman, they literally create a spiritual cartography. And so when they enter into a, a, a form of fugitivity, right, that form where they run away, like that 14-year-old boy, right, or like Tubman does at 27, they use this, few, this, this kind of spiritual cartography to create roots to freedom, and also they use roots for freedom as well. 
And the picture is by Harry Seymour, uh, a retired uh, professor of Africana Studies who lives in Massachusetts. So what do I mean by this? Right? Spiritual cartography is a mental drawing of liberatory maps based on a Protestant God-centric human relational sense of being to one's environment. Spiritual cartography also function in Tubman's life as both a theory and praxis related to justice and liberation. This is really about the enslaved person's ancestral knowledge, right? In the case of the fugitive Tubman. And this is the thing, for disabled people like Tubman, this is quite common. When I have to teach the history of the Western medical tradition where race doesn't, I mean, this is 2,500, 3,000 years ago. So when you're teaching this class, I can't pull on the knowledge that I have about black folk and slavery, but I can pull on the human experience. And so when I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this, I think about Asclepius, right? And this whole, you know, the, the whole kind of um, story of disabled people, sick people in ancient Greece going into the Abaton or the temple to be healed. And the God, right, would say Asclepius would, would literally render them to sleep after having a conversation with them and then heal them. And these people are going there because they know that there's something ancestral and cultural about that and spiritual. And this is what Tubman is doing as this map maker who cannot read words. And so an example of her spiritual cartography, I think is beautifully encapsulated in this, this quote that she gives in the first biography about her life. And she says, before her escape from slavery, and it, it first is the voice of the person who writes this. And then you'll kind of see how it shifts into Tubman's voice, or at least the white author's version of Tubman's voice. But it says, before her escape from slavery, she used to dream of flying over fields and towns and rivers and mountains, looking, down, looking down upon them like a bird and reaching at last a great fence or sometimes a river over which she tried to fly. But it appeared like I wouldn't have the strength. And just as I was sinking down there, there would be ladies all dressed in white over there, and they would put out their arms and pull me across. So when this spiritual cartography of a liberation dream. A, Tubman is talking about an individual dream, but it really symbolizes a freedom route for Black people. Because she goes back 12 times, frees over 70 people, almost all her kin and family from Eastern Shore, Maryland. And, and I'm going to use a big GRE word here, just to show y'all I really did earn my PhD. It's a gynocentric dream. Women sit at the center of this thing. And even though she doesn't say it, a little bit of that Ashante Ghanaian grandmama's work and influence is in there, all dressed in white. And when she's at her most vulnerable, and that is a disabled woman in the 19th century standing five feet, trust me, she was vulnerable and fragile lots of times. Those black women dressed in white have their arms out to catch her when she's falling. And so a part of the spiritual cartography is that it has to be community centered and it also has to value care and love that undergirds it. And beyond having the spiritual cartography, folk like Tubman also have a fugitive logic. I mean, when we think about just not the inhospitable nature of slavery, but also the inhospitable nature of fugitivity, you're on your way to freedom, but you gotta go through swamps and marshes and woods and forests, and you're not allowed to read and write, that's inhospitable. My GPS breaks down, I'm cussing. I mean, I'm, I'm angry because I'm lost, I don't know. And I think about someone like this, how do you develop a fugitive logic? And yet she does. She develops a form of thinking rooted in observation, methodology, and mobility of the environment. But she also makes space in the thinker's mind for folks and beings who control and manipulate the environment. So she has to make sense of folk who are going to put traps in to catch her, but also animals. This is why when she went back, you know, people will always write these things. Sometimes you can't believe the stuff that people wrote back then and even what you read on the internet. She sang songs. No, she didn't. She sounded out bird calls. If it's at night and you know that you live on a plantation and the owner can hear, because I mean, the owner's not hearing impaired. Why would you be like, come on, come down Moses? No, <laughs> but you're going to sound like a hooting owl. That makes sense. Harriet wasn't stupid. Harriet was a genius. 
So she's out here, you know, I, I can't do it. But she's calling out bird sounds at night. And the word has already got through to the people to know. The owner doesn't know, but the people who are looking for freedom know. And so she's thinking, how do I manipulate the environment? Like the enslavers, like members of the animal kingdom. How can I bypass that? And how do I make sure these folk are going to listen to me? I'm five feet. And on top of this, I got a brain injury that makes me dream in, in vivid colors that don't exist except in my mind. That makes me hyper aware of the presence of God, even where people might think I'm mentally ill. And also, I got to go to sleep because I might have a seizure or a sleeping fit. Right. And I'm using the language of the 19th century. And you got to follow this woman to freedom. So you can imagine people are scared. But this is where she has to extract from that inhospitable environment, right? In, in order to make sense. And so what she does is she, she leans on the herbalism. When her mom took care of her, when her grandmother taught her things. So she's giving people wild geranium. Right? She's giving a cranes bill. She's giving people water lilies. Oh, they have digestive problems. I'm going to brew up some tea. I'm going to have a poultice. Toothaches. She has such a bad toothache, and she felt like there was, there was some decay with the, the abscess. She knocked the front tooth out with a gun handle and used a poultice because of the herbal knowledge. These herbs that she was used to in Eastern Shore, Maryland, when the Civil War is going on and the country's greatest military leaders need somebody to come and nurse and heal, they call on Harriet Tubman and also to spy. And so when she goes down to a very similar environment, which is the low country in South Carolina to those old islands, right, near Port Royal and those kinds of places, and she frees, she helps to free hundreds of folk. She does so relying on this, right, on this, this, this knowledge. So she knows that asafetida or things that have opium can put people to sleep, right? Can 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 stop constipation and, and 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 you know, I mean, excuse me, diarrhea, create constipation. Things that can put babies to sleep. You stick a little, you know, a little morphine in a cracker <laughs> and some little bread. The baby won't cry. Right? I mean, she's doing those kinds of things and she understands dosage. And this is before anesthesiology, any of those things are created. I mean, the woman is absolutely brilliant. I don't say that as a form of hagiography hey, because she is my girl crush. I'm just saying it because she really is brilliant. How in the world do you do this and you can't even read a word? You don't understand numbers. And yet you understand where the Big Dipper lies in the sky. You understand how to go through a, 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 a marsh. She does this because slavery allows her to understand it. And that is the, the irony here that slavery actually allows her to understand it. Because when she was leased, she went to her owner and said, if you allow me to work on my own, I'll pay you today, it would be thousands, but $60. And he says, okay. But what she's able to do is she's able to learn the landscape. She's able to talk to men on ships, because this is Eastern Shore, Maryland. And she literally learns the topography of the land. She learns the, how to call, like, call out like birds and animals. She learns the stars. And so she's able to, now I've, I'm giving the name spiritual cartography and fugitive logic. It might change when the book is out. They just work in theories now, so don't judge me. But, but I'm, I'm giving that those, those names. But this is what she's doing, right? Because slavery in essence allows her, and the greed of slave owners allows her to lease out her labor so that she can extract that knowledge and free others, right? And so I promise I'm ending soon. Disability, slavery, and labor, right? Folk who are disabled, like Harriet Tubman, trouble the notion in 19th century practice that the black body, read the able body was meant for slavery and not freedom. What then do we make of the disabled black and slave body? As a slave, she was devalued. As a free person, she was at risk of being exploited and further injured without ever denying the role and function of disability in her life, Tubman presented the opportunity for those considered normal to make themselves malleable to her specific needs. 
basically able-bodied people had to listen to her. They had to be under her command. And so for me, that complicates the ways that we think of people in the past as backwards. And they're doing this before the establishment of a ADA that we don't get until 1990, right? For those who don't know, that's Americans, uh, for, dis of dis Americans for Disabilities Act. Right? So this brings me to the Bemis Center, right? In the first room I walked into this past Saturday, and then, you know, I was like, oh, clearly this is what I'm supposed to talk about, right? Some of the other stuff, I'm, I'm Sylvia, I'm just not that deep. It was a little, it was a little highbrow for me. I was trying to figure it out. I was telling people we were trying to theorize, and I was like, so I'm gonna stick in my historian lane. But it, you know, somebody asked, I was like, it's profoundly disturbing. And I just thought that sounded smart. But this one I could get. Right, this one I could get. The retentions of slavery's inhospitality for black people. It literally tells you about the Mississippi appendectomy of Fannie Lou Hamer, right? This is Rodney, Rodney McMillan's work, right? Medical racism as a descendant of white Southern hospitality. Tells you about the kinds of experimental surgeries that happened from the 19th century to the 20th century in all branches of, of medicine. And let's folk think that we somehow move past this, even in the 21st century. A woman at UVA, I promise if anybody's in the audience from UVA, I went there too, y'all, for my postdoc. I'm, I'm not picking on it, but y'all just keep doing silly things, right? <laughs> you, keep, you keep doing silly things. In 2014, Kelly Hoffman says, wait a minute, I'm, I need to do some research for my PhD. She's in the psychology program, and guess what she discovers? Medical residents, largely white medical residents, believe there are biological differences between black people and white people in 2014. Now, she publishes this in 2016, and they believe all kinds of things. Two of them even believe black people are born with tails. Black people don't experience pain. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, it's amazing. And it's the same thing that those people believed way back when, centuries ago. And then we wonder why these disparities exist. There was a more concerted effort to have healthy black babies and healthy black women's pregnancies in the 19th century in slavery because of the price on enslaved babies' heads than in freedom. That's not hyperbole, it just is. But like Tubman, the very nature of this inhospitality in places like Montgomery, Alabama, considered the other cradle of the Confederacy. Black women who are the descendants of the folk that I talked about, those named and unnamed in historical records, have taken back the legacy. Michelle Browder is an artist who some of you have probably read about. She created these sculptures on her land in Montgomery called the Mothers of Gynecology to recognize the work of Anarka Betsy Lucy and those unnamed women. And so what this makes me think about is the prophetic words of Derrida. Will we ever know what hospitality is? Not yet. But also the ways that the black body has always created a line of contention and nuance and complication when we trouble the water, especially as it comes to notions of politeness and compassion and benevolence on land and in regions and in nations that were literally built off the backs of uh, exploited people. So I thank you for your time and your attention and I welcome your comments and your questions. How's that? Is that better? You can probably hear me without the microphone. Um, so uh, 
This is like Christmas morning. I'm not really sure what to ask first. I have all these things, but I wrote down all these questions. Um, I think the first thing that I want to talk about is reproductive labor. And, um, the difference between reproductive labor for white women and for black women, because even my own children know about reproductive labor because I'm always teasing my husband about how much money he owes me. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, over the years, every meal, three beautiful children, all of the, the uh, boxer shorts folded and put away, you owe me X number of dollars. And um, I mean, I'm joking, but on the other hand, when we talk about enslaved women, there is a real um, function of what we owe them, in other words, right? So I was thinking when you were talking about Michelle Obama and that, <laughs> that crazy day when she stood up and she said, you know, I, I'm really grateful. I wake up in a, in a house every day that was built by slaves. And, you know, everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people in the world went, oh, my gosh, it's like she just said the sun was going to die and, you know, this was our last day on Earth. Um, and people were so upset that she said that. But, of course, we all know it's really true. Um, so, what, so what made me think about that in reproductive labor, we know what it creates. And, you know, as much as we try, you know, women still don't earn as much as men, obviously, and, and certainly black women less. Um, and I know you come from an African-American studies background, and I, I've been in a black studies department for nine years. Um, and one of the things that we always look for is creativity and creation, right? Not just so, you know, if I had to say what one of the big things in African-American history today is, um, how do we celebrate people and their um, attention to, you were talking about Harriet Tubman and all these things that she's doing to take control over her own life. And we know that women everywhere throughout history have always tried to um, be in control of their own bodily integrity, right? Um, no matter what situation they were in. Um, so I guess what I'd like to at, talk more about is um, where do we see women having in these situations um, having autonomy, having some degree of control over their own lives, right? So you, you talked about Harriet, and what else can we say about that? Mm -hmm. um, that's a, a, a wonderful question. I mean, Harriet stands as an exception and not the rule, yeah. um, which is why we you know her name and you know, her life yeah. and, and those kinds of things. But I do think about those women, uh, you know, like the woman who opened the, the hut to heal people because she was affected by the fragility and the pain of, of people who are ill, um, you know, so for me that creates the legacy of institution building. I think about the ways that um, naming becomes so important for, for black women who don't own their children. Um, they don't even own the right to touch their, children's, their children first particularly if the owner or the medical doctor does so first. I mean, slavery even dictates the politics of touch. I mean, those kinds of things that we see as kind of instinctual, right? That after you give birth, you can hold your baby, but you might not be able to if you were the woman giving birth to the mulatto baby in that slave hospital in Montgomery. Um, so naming becomes really important. You know, the fact that I see this tradition that goes on, you know, I think about myself Deirdre is not a quote unquote ethnic <laughs> name that most black people have. Um, Cooper Owens is certainly not. But my middle name is. My, my daddy's name is Ben. And then the, the black girls born to, to black parents during that time in the early 70s, you find Benia. That's my, my middle name. I know people named Claudrina, Whitlet, <laughs> Dad Wiener, you know, those kinds of things. Um, the ways that, you know, in the 21st century naming is, you know, someone says the Sani. Or I remember I was a big sister in uh, Charlottesville through the Big Brother's Big Sister, and my little sister's name was Diamond. I brought her a book, but I spelled her name D-I-A-M-O-N-D. -D. And her mother was like, uh-uh, my baby name is Diamond, D-Y-A-M-O-N-D. -D. I said, ooh, I'm sorry, I will never make that mistake again. Because for her, <laughs> that was important. She needed to yeah. set her apart. Yeah. And so the ways that these things have continued have some, sometimes been derided by the majority um, community. But for black folk, that is important. And so I think that yeah. that's one of the cultural retentions that gives us strength. But also at the end of Harriet Tubman's life, she helps to create the national uh, black women's club movement. Mm -hmm. 
you know, with all of these folk, you know, Mary Church Sherelle and all of these people, she's doing this at the very end of her life and it sets in motion a legacy of black women, you know, being committed to civic, political, social ideals of uplift, um, which we all benefit from today. So, I mean, I think those are the things that really are important, but it also lends itself to those questions that you talked about, the economic value attached to reproductive labor that black women are um, still earning less, mm -hmm. you know, than, than other Americans, um, that Harriet Tubman died in poverty. She had to sell her property um, to ensure that others would have a home who were aged and infirmed, you know, and that is sad where her contemporaries died wealthy, like Frederick Douglass, also from Eastern Shore, Maryland. Um, so the, the gender components of that still exist today too. But so there had to be black midwives as well, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, so if you, if you came in. Right, so if you think, I always call it the R word, yeah. reparations, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna talk about the R word, black midwives would be at the top of that list, right? Because right. they're delivering their own babies That's right. and babies for their kin, mm -hmm. as well as the white babies. Yeah. Which leads me to think, I think the thing that most, you and I could sit here all night and talk about what shocks our students the most, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that is most bothersome or shocking to them is the idea that black women are wet nurses. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, and after slavery, right? <laughs> so this doesn't end in 1865. Yeah. Yeah. Black women are wet nurses well into the 20th, 20th century. Century, century, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of black women being so relied upon as, as um, for child rearing mm -hmm. purposes. And they, mm -hmm. So what do you tell um, I mean, you and I know it's about mm -hmm. racism and, and, and the emergence of, of eugenics and mm -hmm. scientific racism and all this stuff about um, being lesser, but yet nursing is such an intimate yeah. activity and it is, it's some of the hardest work you'll ever do, right, mm -hmm. is to nurse a baby. So how do we... Yeah. It, yeah, that's, that's hard because the students always want to know, I don't understand, how do these people <laughs> write? Yeah. and create these ideas that these are two separate kinds of human beings, yeah. and yet they allow black women to, to have white babies suckle at their breasts. Like it mm -hmm. doesn't, and I was like, it's called racial cognitive dissonance. Ah. You know, I mean, so you can write yeah. a thing, oh, black people don't experience pain. <laughs> and yet, you know, when you're about to have surgery, you have to restrain a black patient just like you would a white patient. Mm -hmm because they're human beings. You can say, oh, this person is chattel, so this person is just like a table or a pen, you know, or chicken, but you also know you can't have sex with a, a pen or, I mean, well, I guess if you want, you can have sex with a chicken, but it won't produce a slave baby, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm not gonna knock somebody's kink if that's what they wanna do. The chicken might not like it, but I'm just saying, right? So, you know, they do that and they know they can do it. Like Thomas Jefferson knew he could do it and not, anything would happen he wasn't gonna lose his status he might yeah. have people whisper about him but he wasn't, his life wasn't gonna be complicated in any kind of way so these racial cognitive dissonances can exist and they sit at the very fabric what i do to bring my students from that time so they can say oh i think i, I understand it primary sources are important and so what i'll say is if we if we find a hard time believing that Think to the 1980s. I said, I know y'all weren't born. Ask your parents. I said, you can even ask me. When I was in high school in the 1980s during the height of the crack epidemic, I moved from Washington, D.C. to rural South Carolina. D.C. was considered the crack capital of the country, but also the myrtle capital of the country. And so moving from that majority Black space where we use words like crack babies, crack hoes, I mean, we said horrible things of people who looked like us. And we believe the things that people wrote about people who look like me. 20 something years later, by the 21st century, we learned that crack babies was all a fiction. We were just talking about low weight, yeah. right? Premature babies. That was it. Notice though, the opioid crisis, which has taken on a white face, nobody talks about opioid babies. Nobody pathologizes or even criminalizes white mothers or, or birthing people who are giving birth to these children. In fact, in conservative spaces, they will carve out funding for recovery for opioid users. And I'm sitting up here like, wait, wait, wait. in DC, and I grew up in the hood in DC, I grew up in Ward 8, Anacostia Southeast, at least that's what they called it, right? 
it, it was a beautiful love community. But I'm sitting here like, wait, 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 there was no funding in my community in DC or in rural South Carolina. That, so those are the things, and when my students read it, I said, I want you to read what Ira Chesnoff and his research team wrote in 1985. Four pages, and they're like this, wait, Dr. Cooper Owens, it doesn't say anything about race. I said, if anything, it just says 23 women, multiracial, all use crack, and some of them drank and used other drugs. But the mainstream press got a hold of it, and they knew that white folk and black folk were willing to believe the worst about black people. And so all of a sudden, Race isn't mentioned in this article, but a uh, mainstream journalist could literally write, black women produce crack babies. And folk caught on to it and held on to it and didn't give it up until 25 years later where people proved it wasn't so. But what does that do, right, to demonize these black women who are, who are mothering children and also, you know, trying to deal with the effects of a dependency, you know, on a narcotic? Yeah. Um, so I also know you're, um, you've spent a lot of time working with medical students and in the medical humanities, and you've even worked, uh, you've gone on grand rounds to help oh, yeah. teach medical students something better. Um, <laughs> you know, you're, you're referencing that study there. Um, but yet the infant and, and, more, and maternity mortality rate for black women, as you said, is in some cases worse in parts of America than in Africa, right? So we like to think of, especially fistulas mm -hmm. as being associated yeah. with these poor African women and they have ha mm -hmm. uh, fistula hospitals and stuff. Um, so with those rates, it's 2022. And of course we like to think we're perfect, right? We're, we're great at being exceptionalists. But what are we doing wrong that so many black women and their babies are dying? Or you have women like Serena Williams saying, no, I think I have a blood clot, and them going, D -d 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 go yeah. get back in your bed, yeah. right? A, a, an educated, mm -hmm. um, forgive the word, articulate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Black woman who has so lots of money. languages, yeah. Right? That, yeah. Um, and yet Serena was lucky to get the drugs that she needed that day. So yeah. what are we doing wrong? Yeah, I mean, I always tell people, you know, maybe they should be looking to West. In Central Africa, I mean, the, the fistula hospitals are largely in East Africa, like so in Ethiopia, places like that, or um, certain parts of Asia, um, South Asia, Bangladesh, those kinds of places. Um, it's only one country in South America where women are still suffering from this. But, you know, if we look at a lot of those independent nations that have a lot of wealth. I mean, Nigeria is an OPEC nation. Yeah. I'm like, maybe yeah. we need to be looking at Nigeria to see right. what they're doing. It's a majority black space. They are not, mm -hmm. that's not to say that there are not problems, but majority black spaces, and I can tell you, until I was 30 and moved to LA, I never doubted my own intelligence or my, my beauty or any of those kinds of things until I went to UCLA and dealt with white folk who had an opposite idea of who I was. Because I went to two HBCUs, I worked at black women's companies in DC, like none of that was, none of that was foreign to me. And so I'm always telling people, maybe we need to look to the, you know, the Caribbean. Maybe we need to look to Western Central Africa and see what they're doing. Also, look at immigrant communities in the United States. Um, when we look at, um, in particular, Asian communities and um, uh, a certain North African communities, you see that the mortality and morbidity rates for birthing people and their children are extremely low. And so I'm saying, what is the cultural, you know, what's that cultural thing? What's that practice that they're doing right? I mean, it's a community affair. What we're dealing with is essentially anti-blackness right. and so also misogyny favoring. Yeah, yeah, in America. And if you have students who are at a high ranking medical college like UVA, I mean, it's, you know, it's essentially a public ivy. Um, and they are coming in with a four year degree. These are not people just coming in from high school they have four-year degrees, and they're still choosing to believe everything that goes against what you and I teach them. What is, you know, they can't say, oh, <laughs> well, they it's, had it's one not history the, class. Yeah, yeah, they can't say, oh, it's not in the science books or the, the yeah. history books. Yes, it is. Yeah. You're choosing to believe opposite because you're like the people who wanted to believe in the pathology of Black women as crack, crack, you know, demons yeah. producing super predator crack babies. And so it's the same thing, right? People are actually invested in anti-Blackness because there's business and wealth and anti-blackness, yeah. cesarean sections, yeah. all of those kinds of things. That brings a lot of money to, to physicians. 
But yeah, it would be awful if we had to go back to sort of like an all black hospital, right? I mean, if you, I mean, but then that put, puts black women back in the seat where they're responsible, like Eunice Rivers, right? Yeah. For Tuskegee, like here, yeah. she's responsible for all this stuff that is happening, but she really yeah, isn't. Yeah, she isn't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just think that it sounds like white let's state, yes, let's state intervention. And um, yeah. if, if we didn't see pregnancy as a medical condition, yeah, but as a biological one. And I don't mean biological in terms of that whole like, who's really a woman, who's really not. I don't mean it like that, but I yeah. mean a biological condition where like your breast, you know, can produce milk. Yeah, it's or, you know, you do a certain thing and guess what? The baby's going to eventually come out, you yeah. know, if there's not yeah. an emergency. Like, that's what I mean by the kind of pure biology of there are certain bodies that contain wounds. And guess what? There's going to be contractions. And guess what? After a couple of hours, <laughs> a yeah. living being hopefully will yeah. emerge. Um, if, if there was less state intervention in that, um, because midwives did a much better job than doctors until about the mid 20th century. Yeah. God for midwives. Yeah. We have a couple of really great questions yes. online, oh. so I'd love to share them. I'm sure some people in the room also have questions. So I'll start with uh, a question from Sophie Lewis. She says, thank you for a brilliant lecture. I'm curious to hear a bit more about the definition of hospitality undergirding this account. Mm -hmm. Is hospitality something then that one can offer from within a space of captivity or, or enslavement mm -hmm. towards, uh, towards one's captor or owners? Ooh, I, I don't think hospitality can ever work from the position of the owner to the captive. It isn't meant to work that way at least from the European conception of hospitality, from, from what I gather. And like I said, I'm not a theorist, but from what, I, from what I gather, it is about the notion of inviting one into a space. So if, and, and Derrida talks about this, um, oh, I forgot the other philosopher, begins with the E, I'm middle-aged, so I have these brain farts. Um, somebody can Google them. But the person that Derrida is building off of, um, uh, who, who talks about religious ethics, it's, Whenever someone enters into the space that is the other, they always remain the other. And so hospitality in the unconditional form doesn't exist. It's always conditional. And so you're never brought into that space um, and, and given the kind of unbridled largesse of, of your compassion and your benevolence that just does not exist. But that's a great question. So question over here, thinking toxic masculinity 2021 uh, and the idea of the objectification, dehumanization of black women's bodies going mm -hmm. back to slave owners, right? Trigger warning, raping black mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking epigenetics here and I'm oh, thinking, yeah. is that why we find ourselves in 2021 mm -hmm. with this toxic masculinity where rape culture is mm -hmm. Situated. Mm -hmm. And we see the statistics indicate that it's typically privileged white men. Mm -hmm. I was curious what your thoughts are on that. That's a great question. Thank you. So first, um, for the, the Zoom audience um, and those here who might not know, epigenetics is essentially um, this conversation that a lot of um, biologists, geneticists, um, people who are really interested in uh, slavery studies, um, have around uh, trauma that is carried generationally kind of through your DNA. And so scientifically, what we're really talking about is the change in gene expression over about three to four generations. So some of the most famous studies have been done either on rats, <laughs> lab rats, or um, um, uh, uh, the, the victims of um, the Nazi experiments and those who went through Nazism. Right, so people who lived through the concentration camps in the 1940s. Um, I'm going to, this is my issue with, with where I think epigenetics can sometimes go into an 18th century racial science mode. It presumes that black people are so different from other subjugated people that somehow our gene expression just doesn't change. And so then what that says is black people as human beings biologically are different. And I'm like, how? I mean, like how, you know, because it, it, it's just a gene expression. Your actual gene doesn't change. 
right? It's just the way that the gene is expressed because of the, the direct trauma. And that only goes through three or four generations. So what I really think it is, and I think this gets at the heart of your question, which you're really asking is, what is it in our society allow, that allows for the transmission and the inherited cultural practice of a masculinity that is built upon the exploitation of women's bodies? You know, in almost everything. You know, I, I, Jennifer's my Facebook friend, so she knows. I tend to I do a lot of talking on social media, um, but in particular, the old people's social media. So you're not going to see TikToks. You're going to see Facebook from me, largely. And I had, a, I had a conversation with a bank president today, and I made sure to come in Sophista Ratchet. That means with a dress where you're going to see my booty. I'm going to wear some big earrings. You're going to see these braids down to my waist. And you're going to still see Dr. Cooper Owens, the person that you can Google and read all the fabulous stuff about. But I wanted him to know that the reason I was in there is because when I made this complaint about racial profiling and banking while black, it wasn't because I imagined it. It's because I've lived in this body for all of these years. And I know that when people see my husband, even though I met him at an HBCU with an African-American studies program in the 1990s in Atlanta, it don't get no blacker than that. Even though I did all of that, right? He still is treated differently because he's a man, got a deep voice, he's tall, and he looks white. And so he was like, baby, you want me to come? No, 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 not today. Because I know we're going to be treated differently. And so when I had this conversation around the very kinds of ways that tox toxic masculinity is even perpetuated by women to other women, he, you know, he was like, oh, I finally, get, okay, I see what you're saying, right? But there is a way that it is just an inherited practice just as strong as anti-blackness is. And so I think that's the real crux of it. And you are right. And then it, it sits inside, you know, it's, it's like, how do you get past that, you know, when you're going through the physiological responses of all of those things that affect our bodies. And so I think that is why we have higher rates of these preventable conditions like diabetes, hypertension, high, you know. It's not just a diet, because Americans have horrible diets anyway. It really is like, you know, what are poor people, yeah, like what are poor white people in Appalachia experiencing? Yeah. What are black people in a lot of, you know, impoverished areas um, where they don't get a lot of resources and services experiencing? What are women experiencing that affects the ways that our body responds to that kind of trauma? So I don't necessarily always think it's epigenetics, I just think it's the cultural practice of a nation that's built on those kinds of things, and we haven't really come to terms with them yet. My name is Erin. My name is Erin Swager. I'm an undergraduate student at University of Nebraska, Omaha. Um, my question regards to, um, since I'm an undergraduate student, um, I am a local here uh, of Omaha, of the Florence and Benson area. I attended um, Girls Incorporated um, Omaha, which is also known as Gir Girls Inc. National. So um, when I was raised, we were taught of um, gynecology and things. So for my generation, graduating now for our millennial generation, how would you say for us, for the girls that are coming into college, to kind of teach them, for us to take responsibility to teach them adv advocacy programs and develop things like this that we're learning within our yeah. coursework and continue on your work yeah. that you're doing now as we go on through our master's or PhD in health society and programs of women mm -hmm. and different kinds of choices. You do what you're doing now, right? So you're an undergraduate, and you can say to your friends, you know what? Oh my gosh, to so your friends and family, I, I attended, I hope you say, a wonderful, a wonderful exhibition and talk, you know, by these really nerdy, cool, middle aged people, you know, who are talking about these things I didn't know about. And then, you know, you can then continue the legacy of the folk I talked about. Maybe institution build becomes a, a club or organization, or it can become an informal space where how do we think about advocacy? Hey girl, let's go and dedicate some time to Googling, right? Um, Dr. Cooper Owens, Dr. Dr. Harbor, Dr. Harbor's in Omaha, 
right? Um, Dr. Cooper Owens is just in Lincoln, just a hop, skip, and a jump away. You know, can I send an email to them? You can. I got lots of jobs that was said at the bottom. I mean, a lot of jobs, because I like nice things. So I work a lot. And so I got a lot of jobs. And so you can contact me at any one of those three emails, at all, any one of those three jobs that I have. But that's the way that you do it, right? You just lean on each other, because institution building is really about community and just an interested person willing to disseminate knowledge first in informal ways, and then it becomes formal. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Two more questions online. The first one is from Deborah Hurd, and she asks, do you see a connection between this medical hospitality on enslaved black bodies and the use of the bodies slash skeleton of two of the moved children by the anthropology yeah. professor at UPenn? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, mm. I had a, because I work at the library company in Philadelphia and MOVE, the, the bombing of the MOVE house happened in Philadelphia under a black mayor, Mayor Good, um, in the 1980s. What happened was because the members of MOVE were either killed, exiled, or sent to prison, uh, the remains of um, the dead bodies of MOVE members was taken over by University of Pennsylvania Hospital. And it has such an old history. It's the, it's the first hospital founded in, in what becomes the United States, so in colonial British America. Um, and it was founded in 1751. And so they used these bodies in the same way the Sarchi Bartman's body was used by Cuvier in the National Museum of Paris, where her genitalia was put on display her brain was put on display, her skeleton was put on display, you literally see the same connections. And who were the first people to be exploited during slavery? Women and children. And so it was so unsurprising for me to learn that these were the skeletons of black children. So unsurprising. In a city that Harriet Tubman, when she first makes her escape, I mean, there are all of these connections. She escapes to Philadelphia because they have the largest population of free people of color in the United States. And so Philadelphia has always been a space where people were trying to work out what black liberation meant. And for the MOVE, um, you know, MOVE members, they were trying to figure out what black liberation meant. Um, and so it, it was just really sad. I was asked to work on it um, because of my proximity to the library company, and I just could not. I, it was just, it was, it was just too much because there are still people living um, affiliated with MOVE. And so I gave that to a, 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 another mentee of mine. Thank you so much for tonight. My question, I'm thinking about kinship and going back to what you were saying before about cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. And so I have two questions, because to me it really seems like there's a, a tension between kind of notions of kinship and notions of not being kin yeah. in that kind of dehumanizing mm -hmm. medical gaze. Yeah. Um, and so, by the way, I'm also thinking about, I don't know if you've read Octavia Butler's novel, Kindred, yes. but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. really on my mind about this. But I'm just wondering if, if there are connections to be made between that notion of kinship and kin and not kin and w.e.b du bois's mm -hmm. concept of double consciousness yeah, yeah. Um, thinking about internalized racism also internalized mm -hmm. misogyny and mm -hmm. how that might play in and then my other question is about science generally and if you based on your work if you see science as fundamentally dehumanizing mm -hmm. and if so what can we do to make it better. Mm -hmm. Those are two very yeah. different questions, but I think they're all related to kin yeah. kinship. I think, um, I mean, ultimately, science as a discipline is, because it, it's, you know, it, it's supposed to be objective, not subjective, right? Um, we are supposed to not necessarily think of ourselves uh, um, as subjects so much as objects, you know, when we think about science. But, you know, clearly, it's, it is human right, um, no matter how much it tries. So the, the, the kind of objective of science, even when you take human beings out of it, is to improve the quality of life for people who are living, for sentient beings. Um, so 
you know, that's the answer to, the, to, the, to that question, I think. Um, the, the first one about kinship is important um, because I think it goes back to the question that um, I think her name was Sophie asked at the beginning of the Zoom Q&A around hospitality. And that's the thing, slavery never affords black people, no matter their proximity to whiteness kinship. You can be, I mean, black people, especially in the South, you're not gonna find a black person in the South who does not have some European ancestry. We don't exist, not in this country, not in this space. People who are quote unquote African-American have a claim to whiteness and yet you will never have whiteness afforded to you. You could be the president of the United States with a white mama <laughs> and they will call you Hussein to remind you that you're not white. And I'm like, but his mama is as white as yours. <laughs> he can be the child of an immigrant just like Donald Trump. And Donald Trump is considered, in fact, more American than Barack Obama. And they both had white mamas, but Donald's was the immigrant. Sally Hemmings can be a quote unquote octoroon. And her children can literally be the, the, the nieces and nephews of Thomas Jefferson's first wife. She's the half sister of his first wife. She has children, multiple children by this man and yet they still were not afforded whiteness. Black folk will never be afforded whiteness. You can have a play black person like Rachel Dolezal. I mean, she, she, she black for play play. She don't even have black relatives. And yet she is afforded blackness. It shows you the insanity of what racism has wrought in this country. So kinship is never afforded as a gesture of hospitality if you are deemed as black, period. Anti-blackness doesn't work that way. And in America, anti-blackness is once again, older than democracy. And so it just is not, because I say it is, that's what it is because those who created the rules and who continue this practice say that's what it is. And that is, I mean, that is the sad thing, but I think that gets at the heart of hospitality and kinship, you're right. And so that's, uh, you know, to kind of take it even a step further when W.E.B. Du Bois talks about that, he says in the problem of the, of the 20th century is the color line, you can still include in the 21st century. Obama showed that, I was just like, my Lord, when a, a, a black man born to a white mama can't even be accepted by white folk? I mean, this was, I'm, you know, I'm bringing all our business in. When we first met, I couldn't believe, he had like straight hair like a white man when we met, which is why we didn't believe he was really black at Clark Atlanta, because people were like, you know, black folk will judge you by the hair. We were like, but his hair's straight, right? And we were just like, what in the, and they were like, girl, you dating him? Did you see his daddy? I was like, no, no, his daddy is black, black. He got a big nose like me and lips. I was like, yeah, black man. And so I couldn't understand why white folk in West Virginia couldn't see that a person with white skin and straight hair and an aquiline nose wasn't white. But they saw his daddy. And I was just like, it, it was the, like, it was the most absurd thing in the world. Because I was like, if you were born in Brazil, if you were born in, 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 you know, Norway, if you were, you would not be considered black. But the United States sure enough gonna make sure you're black, even when you look white. Because black folk aren't afforded kinship. Plus we're both smart women, and if I were to talk to the head of a bank, I wouldn't look about my earrings and my hair and my, you know what I mean? I wouldn't, in fact, I would probably take my white middle-aged husband with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though I think I'm yeah. smarter than him yeah. some yeah. days, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? I would still be mm -hmm. conscious of that. No, the only reason why he was willing to me because he told me, well, I Googled you and you're a very important person. Oh, now you're going to be nice to me. <laughs> I was like, if I twerked on a corner for, for nickels, you still should meet with me if I feel like I was racially profiled. But you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. But you know, I, that was also the class, thing, which I sure. also understand. One last question. Yes, yeah, I know we have over gone time. over and I, I can talk. <laughs> um, great question from uh, Gina Mora. She's talking about medical education. Yes. I have often considered that a best approach is to create systemic approaches in medical care to minimize the impact of race on care, mm -hmm. such as treatment algorithms. 
Others have offered that race should absolutely be taken into account because of the inherent, inherent disparities in care. I would love your thoughts. Yeah, I think, the, um, I think accounts of racism should be taken to, into account, not race-based medicine. Because what we're really trying to track is the ways that, and I'm, I'm talking about black people here, but of course we could insert, you know, Chicanos or Mex you know, Mexicans or, you know, Japanese Americans, you know, depending upon what the condition is or the disparity is. Um, what we're really tracking is how anti-racism affects these people. Because it's not about the quote unquote race. We know that that's not a biological condition. You know, as much as some evolutionary <laughs> biologists argue otherwise, but they also, will say things that are once again rooted in, in fiction. So I grew up believing that black people had a disproportionately large number of folk who suffered from sickle cell. And then I found out that that number in the United States hovers between 11 and 12%. And that's about the same as people who come from um, nations that had, um, you know, that were kind of port nations, you know, near the water. So Greece, Italy, you know, some places in the Caribbean, some places in Asia, right? And so if I were to believe race-based medicine, I believe that fiction when it's actually not so. Um, so I think it's about tra tra uh, tracking anti-racist um, treatments and procedures. You know, um, for instance, using a spirometer that assesses lung capacity and then the clinician changing the dial for the patient being black or white, which is still being used today. Literally, we can have the same measurement, but oh, oh, she's black and this person's white, so I must adjust it for the black patient. That's really anti racist and anti, I mean, excuse me, racist, and that's about anti blackness. Um, in terms of um, systemic and structural changes, I agree with you. When I do the kind of um, consultation work with medical organizations and hospitals, I am always trying to diversify um, medical curriculum. Sometimes they're really, really situated on books from the sciences and from the medical field or health health allied fields and i'm always saying you all need to include some social science work you all need to include some work from the humanities um, because i think we've done a pretty good job at theorizing a lot of this so whether it's um, art or history or sociology you know books that um, the great uh, law theorists and sociologists, uh, Dorothy Roberts, Killing the Black Body, I think is really important. Those kinds of things. Reproductive Injustice by Donna Aileen Davis, who is a medical um, anthropologist. I mean, those kinds of books are really important and they should be included in the kind of structural changes, but also changing the language around how we talk to people, how we give people um, agency and treat them with, with respect and also having healthcare providers also understand the kind of lasting damage that can be done when they are not intentional um, and thoughtful about the ways that they write about patients who can really be impacted generationally um, in terms of medical records. So those are the kinds of things that we really need to be tracking and changing systemically. Thank you so much. Thank you.